I'm Timmy. I'm Justin. And I'm Nathan. And this is Three Old Tech Dudes. It's actually really fun when you do that. <laughs> so, what are we talking about today? I wanted to ask you guys a question. Ask away. Okay. Do you think old technology should be preserved? Well, we kind of have a channel based on it. So, yes. There's that. Thanks for that, <laughs> smart aleck. Next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But why? Why Why should it be preserved? Well, I mean, you know, you have emulators for old computers. That's true. Well, some of it's honestly just nostalgia. I, yeah, that's that's where I was going to go. I don't know if there's a practical. I'm sure there is a practical need for it, but. Um, so I, you could look at it this way, too. I mean, like any gaming system out there, and I'm going to use the Commodore 64 for that's TRC. I'm going to use Commodore 64, for example. So the 8-bit guy, David, I uh, can't remember his last name now, but anyway, um, he has written now two or three games for the Commodore 64. So he's actually made money writing new games for that old system. And he's not the only one either. There's several of them out there. So there's still a market for it, that kind of stuff. So from that perspective, I guess you could say, even though it's a very old system, and in this case, I'm talking about the Commodore 64, and in all honesty, the TRS-80, there is some new stuff out there for that too. Um, it's, I would certainly call it vintage. I mean, 1983 is when that thing came out and yeah, I mean, it's, it's got some age to it, but it still does exactly what it's designed to do. And, you know, like I have two, well, three, I've got an SX-64, but, um, they're running, they work. I mean, I, it's not that they have failed. And the other thing is, I think nostalgia is a big part of it. It probably is for me. Um, just, I mean, yeah, you know, 80 synthesizers, I had a bunch of them. Um, they still do exactly what they're supposed to do. And there's even some new mods and upgrades and stuff like that. For example, the DX7, which never had an arpeggiator and never had a backlit display. You can buy all that for that. In fact, mine has it in it. Um, that's, that's a good case. I think, um, synthesizers, you know, they don't make them anymore. They could make things like them, but they're similar out there, but there's a case for preserving these things and knowing how to work on them before the skills are lost. Now, obviously these things are old to us, but we're still in the same generation as them, but talk about 50, 60 years from now, you know? Well, I mean, let's, yeah. So like the synth that's doing the little linky lights over here, which is JDXI, is all plastic. I mean, it weighs about as much as my phone. My phone may actually weigh more. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, let's face reality. It's probably not going to be around in 50 years. However, my FA, oh, it probably is. But also there's a difference. That's cheap synth. This is a very expensive synth. But the DX7, which is a freaking metric ton of steel probably will still be around as well assuming you take care of them and all that kind of stuff it's like a vintage car so if you have a you know a 57 chevy for example and you've kept that thing in pristine condition and done all the stuff you need to to keep it running it could still potentially do the exact same job that it was designed to do take you from a to b i guess that therein lies the question is there value in that when there are other things that could do it better. Well, so let me, let's take it to synthesizer side of this. Cause there's a guy uh, whose stage name is Kiba. His actual name is Sebastian Tier. Um, he's a synth musician in uh, Finland. Uh, really good. I like, I love his stuff personally. I buy his music actually, but he uses primarily only eighties and you know, some before, 
analog synthesizers. He has a few new ones that are analog because there are some new analog synth out there. But he does it because that forcing him to fit inside a box, this is what the synthesizer is capable of. So he has to do his creation within that box. Whereas if you get like an FA-08, for example, I mean, this thing, you know, the, the DX7, for example, with a cartridge and its internal memory has 64 different sounds, 32 in each. This thing probably has half a billion. I mean, it seems like it anyway. I mean, it's so many that you, you get lost trying to find stuff. So from a musician standpoint of creativity, the limiting factor gives you something to kind of use as a base to move with, I think, personally. Um, and I, that's why I like the DX7, the D50, and the Juno 1, and all those things, because they, they kind of force you to live within their capabilities. But in that same process, it really gives you the ability to do a lot more creativity without having to do... Like, oh, here, I'm going to go search these songs. Oh, I've got, okay, there's 32,000 different sounds in this thing. Um, you know, it's FAO, you can see it on camera here. But, um, but it's one of those that, you know, I mean, a good example is I have more pad sounds in this FAO 8 than the DX7 has total sounds. But am I going to use them all? No. But, you know, same with that. But it's one of those, I think from the music standpoint and even the older computer standpoint, it gives you something to use that that can make, you can fo focus your creativity with. Can I make this computer do a near three-dimensional video game like um, the stuff that David Murray, Murray this is a David Murray, the 8-bit guy, has done. And it, it, he did it really, really well. Um, it just, it gives you a creativity outlet, I think. That's why I don't think that the stuff is necessarily. Now I'll make a caveat to this. If you were to try and keep something like a PDP one running, I hope you have a lot of money because <laughs> the reality is, I think there's probably, I would guess five running. In the, That's know. a, uh, that's a great oh kind of a yeah a great question though because should somebody keep a PDP one running? I think so. I think there should be at least one example of everything out there if possible. Um, yeah. and that's why you have museums like the Computer History Museum has a PDP one. I think they actually have the one that was originally used by MIT to make there's a space war space warp I can't remember what they called it. The, the first actual video game that was a, I mean, it was, you know, it looked kind of like, a, I don't even really call it like an, almost like asteroids, but it was two ships shooting at each other. Sure. Like a space war game. Yeah. And they did that in the sixties. Yep. <laughs> I mean, after, and that was the first computer video game. I should straight the first computer video game. Mm-hmm. On technically, when wouldn't even call that. I think it was called Tennis for Two. Um, came out in the 50s, but that was really not even using... I mean, it was using an oscilloscope for the display, but it worked. And the sad thing is that they just kind of like disassembled the parts and said, eh, we don't need this anymore. Right, right. <laughs> Didn't see that value. <laughs> so I think it maybe goes beyond just, you know, I and I, I buy what you're saying, Nathan, the creativity and limiting yourself but there's also other aspects to it such as uh something that we all three of us own at least one example of uh one of us or two of us own a couple or more just, just a couple uh two radios yeah there, there's no practical reason for us to have two radios like you know from the 30s 40s and 50s yep. but i like them and i think that they should be preserved and the, the fact is you can still make new ones. What's okay. amazing. What's amazing is um, I'm, I've been, I've got a book. I've had it for many years. It's a basically a primer on repairing antique radios. I 
pulled that back off the bookshelf last night and I read half the book because I thought it was interesting just to try to help myself understand the concepts of vacuum tubes. It has a whole chapter just on teaching that. This book was copyrighted in 1991. And even then, the guy that authored it, who had been a radio repairman starting in 1959 all the way up until he retired in the early 70s, um, yeah. he, he considered to radio repair and people with the knowledge to be a lost art in 1991. However, you know, there's a lot of people who have picked up on that. I've picked up on that. We've got at least one video on the channel uh, already where we've went through one, and I, I intend to tackle some real basket cases uh, this year before we get done with the year. So I think you see really, that really a, rough. So you see that with a lot of technology as well. Um, you know, one of the things I think I've commented on, I, I don't know if I've commented on the channel, but I've definitely made you guys well aware that I would like to, at some point play with uh, neon, like blowing neon, actually creating neon signs. Yeah, is. That is an art. And that is something that, you know, it, it's kind of difficult to find someone local that can either create something or repair something that you already have. Well, yeah, the, um, I mean, you can buy the transformers. Yes. You, you can buy all of the parts they're readily available on, on the internet. It's just the, having the skill and ability to put them all together and make something pretty. Well, and that's, I think one of the big things with tubes is there really aren't that many people who understand how they work and how they're supposed to work, but they're still out there. I mean, we lose, sadly, more and more, you know, every day, but um, who just had the knowledge. In and that's one of the reasons that I asked this question is I think it should be preserved and it should be repaired. And I think YouTube's an excellent medium for causing that to happen. That's why I have chosen to begin repairing my stash of dead radios and other electronics. Uh, and they will all be right here on Three Old Tech Dudes, all of these repairs. So. Um, we'll intersperse videos like this between them because I don't want to kill everybody with, you know, four repairs in a row for a month. That would get old, but <laughs> it's kind of fun to watch the introduction of old technology to someone new. There, there are people that don't know how to use this phone right here. Yeah, true. there are YouTube videos of it, actually. Oh, I'm sure um, of that. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, this phone does work. That's so it's cool. Fully, it's fully functional. I can pick it up right now and make a phone call. So let's talk about that. There's another good example. Uh, you you enjoy those phones. You you own several, I think, right? I do. Um, you, you probably see a value in keeping those around, even if it doesn't go beyond you. It's kind of neat that you're able to keep those and preserve them and, you know, enjoy them. I think for me, it's, it's goes back to the nostalgia thing. You know, this, this is the type of phone that, that we legit had when I was a young child. Um, I think when I was eight or nine, we, we finally got a cordless phone. Um, it, it was one of the crappy eighties cordless phone with, you know, a range of like a hundred feet, but <laughs> you know, we, laugh. When we first got our first cordless phone, which was in the eighties, about mid eighties. It was only touted to have a range of about a hundred feet. It, however, because there wasn't anyone using that band anywhere close to us, we were able right. to take that thing about a quarter mile and it still work. Had the like telescoping antenna that was like three feet long when you <laughs> pulled it out. Yeah, <laughs> those 49 megahertz phones were no joke. They would really go. Yeah. It was a Panasonic 49 megahertz. Dad got it. So my dad died of cancer. Uh, but when he was in remission, friends of his like, well, we're going to get you a phone so you don't have to, because he, he lived on the phone, um, literally. He's on the phone 24-7, but that's, you know, he was a politician, all that kind of stuff. Um, so he lived to talk for people with people, all that kind of stuff. So he, friend, his friends get, got him that phone, and I didn't, and that phone was amazing. You could take it and go halfway down the neighborhood, and it would still work. <laughs> so, I mean, that was actually pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, our phone in the house that he used all the time was a rotary dial just like that. Um, yeah. In fact, we still had we had a functioning rotary dial when side so moved back to that house. Um, oh, shoot. About 10 years, uh, about 12 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was. And I was there for about a year. Um, transition in life, just put it that way. And in the basement, we still had a functioning rotary phone 
Mm-hmm. Um, it was the only one in the house. It was the rotary, but it, it was there and it still worked. I don't know if it would actually accept a dial anymore, but it would, you could talk on it. So, yeah. And the funny thing is, so you see this in a few movies or and a few TV shows right now, but that thing had like a 500 foot cord on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. you watch old TV shows like I Love Lucy or the Dick Van Dyke show, and they, they there's a lot of telephone action in each of those series, and they're always grabbing the phone in the little, you know, deal underneath the receiver, carrying it around the room and stuff on the long cord. Right. <laughs> or just the receiver cord itself a lot of times and, mm-hmm. and houses were long <laughs> yeah. you saw that a lot on wall phones um, the rotary dial wall phones and even the push button ones um, because those were typically located in people's kitchens yep and we so one the kitchen one the basement one the basement. yeah they had the long cords so you know mom could could gossip and t- and cook dinner at the same time <laughs> that's right we had so the one in the basement was the handset had their long part the other part was actually on the wall mm-hmm. so, um it's, it's probably gone now, but it's one of those. It was kind of funny because I finally got sick of the thing, turned it off the wall. Because I'm like, I I don't use that phone. I, you know, oh, sad. I know it was, it was it was twelve years ago, and I was like, phones. Who wants it? You probably threw it away too, didn't you? Uh, no. <laughs> it's Nathan, man. <laughs> you don't throw it away. <laughs> Honestly, I think it probably no. Because I moved out of the house, and then mom cleaned it out and sold. I say it was it was a long, convoluted history of that, but yeah. So that, I really don't know what happened. It might it probably got recycled. I don't know. It may still be there for all I know. <laughs> Could be still hooked up receiving phone calls. I wouldn't shock me, but I just don't know why you would use it. But you know, I don't. Know. Um, those little phones, they held up pretty good, but they were like really, really well built. They were well built, and if the part, if anything failed, and the most common failure was the ringers, yeah. um, they were very modular in design. So if you take the the bottom off and or you know the top part and slide it off, it, it's they made it to be replaced. It was manufactured with the idea that you would have to replace parts. Yeah, this will fail. This is how we fix it. Yeah. And that, that's something that's lost in pretty much every electronic device known to man now is the, the idea that somebody might want to repair it. No doubt. I think that's intentional and I don't care for that. Um, I think it is too, because then you, well, like, like these phones. I mean, I know my grandparents, they got theirs from the phone company because that was when you got, that's where you got your phone back then in the, the late sixties, I'm going to guess. Um, in 95 when when we sold their house that phone was still working yep i mean companies don't want that anymore because you buy one if you bought one why would you need to buy another one then that's right you're not kidding i mean it's some of the junk out there oh my gosh and even if you do repair yourself sometimes the parts are garbage it's pitiful so right they like it's it fails because they're designed poorly probably with the concept of failing Sooner Either that, or they're designed. They're designed to be cheap. Uh, right. Well, like like the instance of the starter, where the starter that you were talking about, Nathan. What was that like? Eighteen bucks or no, something. The junkyard dig starter. Yeah, yeah. the burnt turned video. Yeah. And you're like, how can how can you afford to make this and sell it? Well, there's a, there's an easy way. <laughs> yeah, we touched on that in the bail thing video. Yeah. Don't pay the people any money. Don't, don't pay them, enslave them. It's not good, but. Kind of sad, but the insatiable yeah. appetite of the world gets it gets that going anyway. I mean, it's you like the last VCR is produced. Oh, those were all junk. God, they're junk. I mean, they were everything was plastic. Everything, everything. I mean, I saw so I think, soft plastic. Oh yeah. Well, so when I got out of college, I first went to work as a bench tech, like fixing whatever came in the door. And most of the stuff was RCA because it was I was working in Bloomington, and that's where RCA was. RCA had a major plant. It would have been such a fun job. And well, I actually worked on stuff like that. It was all new, so we nearly see the stuff almost brand new walking in the door. But it really became obvious. I mean, when I started there, the stuff was, yeah, for the most part, pretty decent stuff. But about the time I was getting ready to leave that and, and go on to into the IT world. This stuff was junk. I mean, the camcorders, if you just bump them wrong, would break. You know, you get some of the big old camcorders. I have a couple, obviously. But, 
you know, thank you. You could beat someone with those things, just like the old radio, beat someone to death with them. You know. But you could you could drop that thing, and most of the time you could fix it by just taking, bending everything back in place and popping everything back together. The, the camcorder is about the end, would be about mid nineties. We're designed to be disposable. I mean, oh yeah. When I was about ten years old, uh, we had a Sony Trinitron, you know, a thirteen inch, nice, nice, nice little television. Um, yeah. I would play Nintendo on it. Well, one day the lightning storm came through and hit the house and that, that killed the Trinitron. And I, it sat around for a while and I kept begging my parents, let's get this fixed. I want this TV back. Yeah. And they took it to a TV shop in Bedford that was still operating and he got it going. It went for about another two years and then it died again. Um, hmm. I think I have not had a chance to go look. It may still be in the basement of mom and dad's. To this day, ooh, that sounds like a video. That's all. It's about a 1988 Trinitron, and I, I bet, I bet we can get it going. Heck yeah! You It'll be power supply related. So, so it's pro- well, yeah, it's hard to tell. It is, it is uh, the modern style with the standby. Probably one of the earlier ones, you know. So you just tap the button to power it up, but that, that's what goes away. Mm. It just quits doing anything. So, is it a hot, hot board, or is it using a? Uh, transformer i suspect it's a hot board having seen a similar one on another youtube channel so <laughs> that's well, why they saved money back in the day they moved to a hot chassis is actually called i'm sorry that was the worst idea i've ever seen yeah. like if you if somehow you got like a piece of metal in there that was grounded and touched the ground to ground it would pop the board yeah it was like this I I can't understand why the FCC allowed that to go through. To me, that is wholly unsafe. Yeah, and, I suspect the guy that got it fixed for me um, fixed something to get it working, but it probably needed something else. <laughs> or with lightning, it may have just weakened another part and finally failed. That's just that's lightning. Oh, it's, lightning is a pain. Lightning is a real pain. Well, what I'm hearing is. Tim should go raid his parents' basement. There's a couple things down there I'd like to repair, honestly. It's things I left there when I was in high school. The basement doesn't get changed much there. So mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot of things I left there are still there. <laughs> it was like when I cleaned out this room, yeah, which is now much. my office. It was it was formerly my bedroom as a child. Um, I bought my parents' house. Yeah, so yeah. Um, this room had been untouched and used for storage for, well, quite a few years. So I, I found stuff from when I was in high school and... I bugged these guys because I kept sending them pictures like, hey, look at this. And they're really probably enjoyed both that. like, good Lord. I really enjoyed that, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so much of the stuff that I had as a kid has just vanished over the years, which, I mean, I'm, I'm turning 49 here in a month and a half. But a lot of my stuff from the early childhood has, um, and it, most of it was due to me. So, you know, I went through a phase when I was like, 12 13 where i was like you know what i, I want to grow up i don't want toys i you know get rid of all of this junk um and i gave a lot of it away and threw a lot of it away it reminded me I'd, i was helping my parents clean out something a while back and uh had a lot of stuff we had stored and let's see if we can get this in here you see that you know what that is oh it's a yak back uh-huh <laughs> road rules from about 1994 95-ish i found this yak back so <laughs> Battery's oh. a little, little corroded in there, but well, you know, I, I I couldn't decide if this was enough of an item to do a video on. Oh, I think we should, but I think it is because I'm sure it oh, works. Yeah. I just need to clean those batteries up and put new ones in it and clean the terminals. Is that, up is that the fine. one that has the uh, the like effects that you can put on your playback no, as well? Oh. This is the really simple one. It just has a say button and a play button. Okay. <laughs> That is fun. Yeah, so there's one for you from my childhood. So. It's akin to the talk boy. Yes, I remember uh, Remember many a kid getting those confiscated in junior high. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want a Tamagotchi, like an original Tamagotchi. Shoot. The little virtual pets yeah. on a keychain. I feel like I was a little after my time of playing with that sort of thing. Maybe it wasn't, though. I don't remember when those first came about. I, it was, I didn't have one, but... Um, there were some some people in school that did, but yeah, I was I was a little old because I think we were almost probably, probably, we were in high school. I yeah, we were in high school 96, when, 97 ish when those came out. <laughs> yeah, that I remember the yak back because there was actually so I I grew up watching Road Rules 
on MTV. Um, and so yeah, because I didn't know what you talking about. Tell me about that. What yeah, there, there was a yak back. I just remember it was it was like on the dashboard of the RV. Okay. <laughs> so that's what made me think of road rules. I need this when Tamagotchi came out, looks like. So that's <laughs> <laughs> scary. <laughs> It's actually, at the time he came out, I was starting to work for the school system. That's just funny. So. Timmy made my night. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> I know of at least one uh, song by the Christian rock band from the 90s, Audio Adrenaline. They recorded a song called Chevette, and the uh, the yak back is, is a uh, credited instrument with a player in that song. Wow. So. <laughs> uh, toys, huh. so toys are used, like, a lot of toys like that, like the little Casio PT-1, I think it was. You go, dee, doo, dee, doo, dee, dee, doo, dee. I mean, you'd actually step All right. Just, that was used on like pro audio tracks, and it's like this little tinky kids toy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of sampling that, that like that. Well, we've talked about before the 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 speak and spell that has been sampled before. Mm-hmm. That voice synth. Yep. Yep. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I never did get into the little dinky key. I had a couple of them as a kid, but I'm like, I want an actual synthesizer because I like, you know, I hold notes, you know, the chords. <laughs> so so where did we arrive? There's there's no true value in it, but it should be preserved. I disagree. I think there is value. It may not be value to everyone, but, you know, there. I, that's as, fair. Just as many people, for example, somebody contacted us via Facebook wanting to give away an 8-bit computer because they didn't want to see it thrown away. Yeah. Right. So I think people recognize that some of this stuff has some, maybe a nostalgic or a don't throw it out. We should save this somehow value. It can at least it's make what someone you run happy. into a lot. Yeah. And it should, maybe the next generation would like to see it. I mean, we're talking about C64s and stuff and forgive me, Nathan, but Justin and I are a little young for that. We we're pretty young little kids when those were new, Yeah, but we still enjoy learning about them. But I didn't have one at home when I was a kid. That's now, here's here's something. So we did the arcade expo a couple of years ago, and you could definitely see that. And because it wasn't just an arcade expo, they also had a room set up for like retro consoles and and computers and things like that. There were like little, you know, eight, nine, ten year old kids that were just eating that stuff up. I mean, it's they true. were they were legit having fun playing those games. Well, it's one of those things for like for the kids that were seem like any of that were there uh yeah there's like you know like say a 10 year old kid for example he's looking at a computer like the atari 400 or the commodore 64 that's older you know that's probably older than his parents right possibly true that's true one of those it's like you know if you had young parents i mean it's just it's one of those things that i think you know that's like came out of their grandparents generation almost yeah mm-hmm. well and the stuff like the 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 uh, the Atari 2600 came out in 76, 7? 77, I think, officially. So. Yeah, so, I mean, that goes way back. Yep. Uh, that thing had a wildly long market life. Uh, it was yeah. sold until 92. So. Yeah, wow. Well, that's, yeah, because yeah. I always thought the Commodore 64 had a ridiculously long life in it. Yeah, I think the 2600 exceeded it slightly. The Commodore did have a very long life. Not, not too different, maybe a couple years shorter, but um i'm just you know it's to, it's really neat to see the kids and they're like you know they're looking at some of this eight. so i think i told you guys let me just caveat story so when i was teaching at the vocational school i brought up the game on a virtual commodore 64 it was running on my laptop emulator i can call it um and i showed them there's a program kids taking programming class so I showed them the game Impossible Mission, and I played it in front of them a little bit just to show them kind of what it was about. And then I asked them, so how big is this game? And they're like, oh, we could probably make that work for you know 30 or 40 meg. I think I could probably fit the code into 30 or 40 meg. I'm just going, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'd hope so. And they're like, well, how big was it? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, like this. The smallest answer I think was five meg. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. it's 170 k. So yeah, <laughs> totally foreign to them. <laughs> and they're like, how? <laughs> like, we didn't even have portable storage that would do five meg. And all the no. the bitmaps were, you know, I mean, all the, all the bitmappings were literally, you know, a sprite might be 
you know, yeah. it's far less, it's a couple bytes, you know I mean? So hey, you, you can get a lot out of those in, at that level of programming. So, yeah. Cause that thing had like the base layout for the rooms and then you had like four or five sprites. Yep. And there'll be some collision detection code, but it's not yeah. that it was going to be big. So the audio, the fact that actually spoke. Yeah. Was <clears throat> honestly really, really impressive. For I've time. never played the C64 version. I owned that for the Atari 7800 console and it's pretty nice on that. I don't, it doesn't yeah. speak, but it does speak in a Commodore 64. That's neat. Model. It that's starts neat. out and goes, you know, I don't know. This is he does. Stay a while. <laughs> Forever ago. Um, it does say a lot, but it says enough that you're going, wait a minute. The, the Commodore can actually use voice. Yeah. It did have the ability to play uh, basically wave files. That seems like a good subject for uh, we've talked about doing a series of videos where we compare games across various systems. So yeah. we find impossible mission on as many things as we can find it and talk about it. So. <laughs> that was a fun time too. Not that I lived through a lot of it, but I mean, there was just so much innovation going on in the gaming world. Then I enjoy documentaries of that time period and arcade. I mean, I'm a big arcade nut anyway. I love coin op stuff, but um, there was truly a lot of, well, there was innovation, but there was also, once it started making money, there was also a lot of greed involved in that industry. So you had a lot of recycled code. Uh, um, and you can tell that on some games where it's like, yeah, they just ported this over. They changed a few things and rethemed it. When Atari lost the Activision lawsuit in 1980. Um, <laughs> Ooh, this is a TRS-80 game. And look at it. It's, it's Pac-Man. <laughs> Make, mega bug. <laughs> but there's i've got two of them here i think i haven't played i haven't played either one of these yet so i just got these like they came with that they came with that color computer you got i just ordered them at the same time on you know, oh, okay popcorn and mega Bug. i'm pretty sure both of them are basically clones of pac-man mm. sure maze but, chompers so yeah there's there's several out there it I mean, became I, a genre to some extent at the time so yeah and that's but I that whole you know that whole time period was really trying to see okay I mean if you consider what they got the Atari twenty six hundred to do man that thing had no RAM it had what sixteen bytes of RAM I mean it was basically nothing it was, it was a little more I'll, I'll put it in the video here below I I have managed to I think I've said this before I at one point using the emulator I did manage to learn how to create a working kernel for a cartridge they, because those those hmm. things are dumber in a box of rocks logically the tar joint there's nothing in that thing no. um it's a per scan line update whereas writing assembly on the c64 the vic 2 is handling all that you don't have to think about it i mean yeah. it's basically got a video chip <laughs> to do it but you you literally have to write the video handling code in an atari cartridge for the 2600 it's amazing they ever wrote a game that worked that's how hard it is i i was floored when i made like three lines on it I was like, look, I made three lines. I'm like, this is too hard. I'm done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are designing some pretty amazing games on the 2600. Way more than you'd think. Wait a minute. Is this even possible? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, just considering what that thing has in it, it's like nothing. But yeah, that's. They invented bank switching so they could access more ROM. Like they could throw a bit and it would change all the memory addresses in real time to a different part of the ROM to read more game data. I'm like, oh, yeah. what? What kind? Electrical engineers blow my mind. <laughs> they start making it do things it was not designed to do, basically. Yeah. And that's how the games began to grow. <laughs> yeah, you had to, I mean, the Commodore 64 did the same thing. You had to think outside the box. You had to yeah. think, okay. Yeah, I could do it too. Yeah. Because you could have a cartridge with more RAM in it and yeah. bank that in. And, you know, and it had tri state memory too because of the 6510. It, you could do some neat stuff with it that I'm just now learning barely anything about. But, yeah. And it's, it's yeah. hard to go from a modern programmer back to the early late seventies, early eighties stuff. Cause you really have to, you have to start to know your stuff on the electronics end. So, but it kind of, yeah. Cause you are literally saying, okay, I want to have you know, this transistor switch doing this. Um, yeah. But from a guy who learned building all that stuff in the first place, I mean, when I took electronics, I went to IDT, you know, you learned how to, build a processor discreetly with ttl chips i mean you know so yeah it's like <laughs> one of these days we'll look at the ttl logic collection i've got 
I'm interested in learning more about that anyway. I mean, it's like all these things that are old hat to some people. I'm just now like, hey, I've never learned about that. I want to go learn about it. Mm-hmm. And it comes back to preserving technology. I, I feel like people should carry on things like tube radio repair. I That is so hard for me, but I'm finally getting it. Like it took years and years. I'm like, oh, now I can do uh, ripple filters. Okay, well, that's not too hard. And the radio guy's not going to think that's a big deal. But I'm about to where I think I could align a whole radio. And that's a little tricky, but if you know what you're doing and are careful, you can, you know, basically tear the thing down to the bare metal and put it back together and get it all set up again. That's, that's a goal I have probably in the next couple of years so, I've, on an all American five, because I want to learn easy. <laughs> so I've got some old handbooks that have a lot of tube information, in a lot for radio and even for some basic audio. So yeah, we'll, uh, I think when we start doing that, we should actually like pull out some of that stuff, you know, and, and lay it out and go, look, this has, this is how you can figure this stuff out here. So you can find this stuff like the mm-hmm. tube radio manuals, the radio tube manual, rather, like the RCA receiver. The RCA one has, and this book I was re- mentioning earlier in the, uh, the video here, uh, had a whole section out of one of the RGA, RCA receiving tube manuals that literally that. showed a schematic of one of the cheaper RCA all American fives and literally told you every single thing that was happening. I'm like, Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's becoming a loss, sadly enough, almost an art at this point, but um, there's probably, well, there's probably a lot of people still have to do it, but there's just very few that are really doing it. Uh, Cause like when I went to ITD, they didn't really teach tubes. No, they, they quit teaching it because it became a skill that was unnecessary. Yeah. It's time to learn about the new stuff, which makes sense. I mean, it does. But I wanted to know, so I grabbed books and started trying to figure it out. Because vacuum tubes and computers go well together. Oh, yes. Um, but you have to remember, the first electronic computers were vacuum tubes, like ENIAC and Colossus, for example. It would be wild to try to build a some sort of processor with tubes. I've, it's crossed my mind. Yeah, it's something it, simple that can count to 10 or something. <laughs> just getting it. Um, I saw a little bit of the schematic for, I think it was the Univac, maybe. And I have to go back and look at that. But it was mm-hmm. like, it had to have like buffer tubes to buffer for this thing and time delays because it would arrive at the different time the stuff they had to go through to make that work that we would like even in a ttl world would just simply take for you know for granted to go oh yeah yeah wow <laughs> yeah i mean, I mean but, tubes were just basically diodes and variations of di- diodes that's really what they are most of the time you had, so. you had voltage controlled yep. switching Yep, with the grid, yeah. Yeah, with, with <laughs> so you could do variants and whatnot, and you know, for for a switch, you just vary it all the way off or all the way on. Um, that's true, because that's how a tube radio basically works. Is when you a lot a lot of more you adjust the volume control, you're just in the grid, yeah, <laughs> the grid bias, and it shifts the whole receiver up and down, not just your audio. A lot of people don't realize that. So. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, but yeah. So I I I can't agree with the statement. I don't think. I, I get a lot of people don't want to have older stuff necessarily. It's I think that's just a fact of people. Some people like old stuff, stuff some don't. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I've got some I, stuff that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I don't have. Some people look at a DX7 and go, "Why in the heck would you ever want one of those? Look, it won't do. You know, I can't just go in here and go. You know, I can't simply make sound. I have to." you know, and go through all these steps and it won't do like layers and everything else. It, and it's, you know, it doesn't have anything like this. You know, that's a nice e piano. That was really yeah, nice. This is actually, that's like, this is a uh, grand piano. And then and now I want to go to cheers. Yeah. <laughs> but the grand piano made me want to go to cheers. <laughs> um, yeah. But some people look at us and go, you know this this does everything why would you need that well technically yes that's Mm -hmm. true this does do pretty much all the same stuff that will do plus a couple quadrillion more things but some of it's nostalgia 
some of it's well the dx7 for example for me it was when i was a kid that was the keyboard i wanted to have as a kid and i couldn't afford it right so i'm an adult now once yeah. you can't afford it you should have it you can't yeah. afford it so i'm gonna have one you mm-hmm. know and yeah you know, and i bought that one that i told you guys before i mean i got a really really good deal by today's standard um <laughs> Under twenty seven dollars delivered wasn't bad. Oh. Um, yeah, a little bit more now. You should have bought five. Uh, yeah, and then turned around and sold them. I, I kick myself for not buying a few other cents, honestly. But goodness. Yeah. So I think it goes beyond technology, though. Um, let's look at pop culture. You know, I, you both have kids um, around the same age. Yeah. <laughs> they enjoy watching shows that were not around in their lifetime um possibly shows that weren't even around in our lifetimes um i know my two people still people still watch i love lucy true yeah my two boys enjoy watching star wars the first one like number four which was the first Mm -hmm. one and that happened you know i was a kid when that thing came out it came out what said 76 77 77 that's one of those movies that technologically speaking held up well i was gonna say yeah it's yeah it's it's an advanced movie for its time so right you want to see the difference go look at uh uh, logan's run and then look at star wars you realize that they came out like i think it was about eight months apart (laughs) smoking the bandit was the number two movie that year (laughs) ah yes what's that tell you (laughs) it it was only beaten by star wars or it would have been the number one Uh, movie of that year (laughs) that's a funny movie though it's very good but yes technological it ain't (laughs) But it never said it was either. Not I mean, hardly. It was two guys trying to get across country. The car car crash movie is the whole idea. Beer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Delivering beer across country. Yeah. Like uh, but it was, it was a comedy. Yeah. But that's okay. It's a different genre. But the sci-fi genre, I mean, if you, you know, honestly, the duality, you want to see it like really, really close time-wise. You know, Logan's Run to Star Wars, man. Logan's Run is either it's a cult classic movie now. But this, the effects in it compared to Star Wars are just a abysmal joke. It really, yeah. <laughs> you know. But you have to also remember the Star Wars. Star Wars was so advanced that, I mean, it, it you know it was one of those. It it changed the landscape of sci-fi mm-hmm. big time. Um, you know, but that's that's kind of part of it. I mean, yeah, like. Like kids like, you know, today, some of the kids, because like my boys love playing around with these synthesizers too. You know, some of this older stuff. I mean, sure. I think you've seen John's room. He's got, <laughs> Gabriel's, he's got one of my synthesizers in his room right now. Um, Get some use out of it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm like, that's fine. You need a keyboard to play with here. Just, you know, when you're done, bring it back. But, you know, just here. You just so you're done. Um, I have in my garage a Hallicrafter's receiver, ham receiver that my dad brought over here. It's pretty bad, like condition wise. I'm not ready to tackle a tube rig that complex, but I might eventually. So, well, my Collins R390 is one of the most complex tube radios ever made. I'm glad I don't have to mess with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this <laughs> one's not that complex, but there's there's problems. There's there's mechanical broken parts and things so the mechanical um, parts of the old tube radios is kind of impressive how much mechanical they really are the most impressive tuner i have seen is actually in a realistic dx302 from 1981 because almost yeah. all of those are trashed because the plastic gears seize and crack I bought one because my dad got a working DX300 from a year before at the ham fest. And I wanted it because those TRF I had, or it's not TRF. Uh, there's a term for it. I'll insert it here. Cause I've forgotten where you have to use a pre-selector and then another knob to get it. They are so much fun to tune. Um, like they're actually fun to sit there and work. And yeah. I got one and then the frequencies wouldn't turn because the gears are stripped out and they're made of an obtainium. So I don't know. I think I remember when you bought that. I do. I still have it, but I, it's like, man, I don't know, I have to go like to a hobby shop and look through a pile of gears to even have a chance, and then I'll have to figure out how to epoxy it on. And the thing's so they they freeze up mechanically is what happens. They wear out. But could you three well, D print one? Maybe. You just three D print it. I mean, yeah. 
the because uh, I've got that one, um, the, the Drake Two B. Mm-hmm. Just the only wrong with is filter caps. Just like breathe, God, it's like Bang. I'm good at filter caps. Uh, so they sell the, <laughs> the actual filter cap for that on eBay. That's weird that they would have a very specific one. <laughs> I mean, it's like it says, this is for the Drake 2B and the Drake blah, 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 whatever. As long as it's not new old stock junk. So. No, it's new production. Good, so good. High temp cap and everything. Um, so I'm like, well, there you go. That's nice. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely. I could. I would definitely have to say I'm kind of an, an old technology freak. I mean, I call it our 390 uh, friend of ours, which we've had on the channel here before. Uh, let me use it while I was in in college in my apartment. Of course, the thing has a freaking hundred vacuum tubes in it. <laughs> Each your apartment um, quite well, <laughs> right? But that, you know, but I sit there used to listen to like shortwave and everything else with that stuff. And I mean, it was a one room apartment. I had the antenna wrapped around the outer perimeter of the room. <laughs> That's cool. So the consensus, I guess, here seems that we think you should preserve old technology and it should be repaired and kept in working order. Uh, you wouldn't believe the number of people that put antique radios up as a showpiece because it's broken. And then just stays that way for years and years and years. Just it's they're too easy to learn to fix. OK, those that's a biased people, comment, though. So I feel like they're easy to fix once I've learned how <laughs> do those do those same people care to have it working though, I guess is Maybe the other not. question. Like my old Admiral radio that I have, I, it's probably been close to a year since I've turned that thing on. Yeah. And I often use a part 15 AM transmitter to listen to things I'd rather have. You know, I've a lot of my AM radios become an Amazon, uh, echo, so to speak. So mm, yeah, <laughs> hook up Alexa and yell at it and it'll play you songs, even though it's a 60 year old AM radio. So <laughs> now what's fun is to use one of those transmitters and go on like archive.org and oh, pull yeah. radio broadcasts from the era that your radio, like in my case, you know, go and get a radio broadcast from 1936 and yeah. listen to it over that radio. That's a fine radio. I don't know. I have one that old in working order. I have a silver tone from 38 yeah. that is dead out in the garage. That's super so. lucky. You were the reason I own that radio. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I thought in a million years it was going to be a dead pile of junk. I, I was you were kind of agging me on. You're like, yeah, go ahead and buy it. It's it's worth what he's asking. Go I ahead. Could, hoping I could get you turned on to the world of tubes. <laughs> so. And I, I buy the thing and it doesn't work. And then I like to I go to the I look inside and just like poke yeah, at the tube all, and it was, all of a sudden it comes alive all it was is you had a filament <laughs> pin that wasn't connected good and those are strung in series and man the whole thing will just come to life you get everything connected sometimes so <laughs> yeah that's tubes are you know i kind of wish i still had some of the stuff from my grandmother's house that was tube type but you know, it's, it's long gone so yeah i mean it is what it is i guess yeah um it's worth noting Everything I've learned, I learned on the internet with tube radio repair. I have a couple books, but the real practical pitfalls and traps you fall in, I've learned from uh, sites like uh, Phil's Old Radios. It's been on the internet since the mid-90s. Um, he's an expert in teaching how to recap radios and things you should watch for and the kind of capacitors that are all dead. Uh, everything I did in that Westinghouse radio repair on our channel recently are concepts I learned from that site. And, okay. you know, check these well you don't need to check the ceramic caps they're almost always good so i didn't and i replaced the paper caps and it made a difference in how that radio performed as far as reception it really cleaned it up and my radio needs some work but i'm almost afraid to touch it well you know because, a guy like i don't want it to like you know catch fire and burn down you you know a guy <laughs> there's a chance it's running old caps that just happen to still work but you don't want to leave it plugged in with those in it so yeah well, it's like if you if you're so if you decide to like collect a TRS eighty, like a model uh, two or model three, the gray or the white, all in one units. Before you turn that thing on, open up the power supply, and at this point, there's a there's a I'll send you the picture to put now, but it's the little little filter cap on the AC line. You're better off just simply taking a wire cutters and cutting that thing out because it mm. will explode on you. Sure, you sure. You don't actually need it. It's a noise filter. Sure. Uh, I mean, I recommend replacing over time, but at least to test this, you can just just cut a lead off that thing, tend that to short it out, you know, because it'll go boom and start sizzling. And you have smoke coming out of the thing. It won't actually cause it to die, much like the blue TV incident. Yeah, yeah, but it, <laughs> it will smell so bad. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and I don't know why it would ever, I've never experienced that. <laughs> I should take my old TV apart. So I have a TV in my parents, but it's probably maybe a 10 inch. It was a portable, well, <laughs> portable, <laughs> portable, like, you know, 30, 40 pound unit. Um, and it, it's downfall was, so it had electronic volume control. Okay. And neither the up or down work now, but I think it's just like whatever pokes the entered button has come loose. Yeah, that could be. Do you know what it is, Brand? Um, I think Magnavox. Yeah. Those Ought are to be repairable. Yeah, it's repairable. Oh yeah, I think so. what I used to do when I still used it was I would plug an external speaker into its headphone jack that wouldn't be overpowering at full volume, which is where it stuck. There you go. And then I could use it. Yeah. Um, here's one I've thought about doing for the channel that's different. That's a nostalgic item. My dad in the late seventies, uh, before he, before he met my mom and the like, he, he uh, had some pretty nice pickup trucks. He bought a brand new like 79 Ford, and then he bought a brand new 80 Ford. <laughs> Man. Yeah. He traded the 79 on 80, but at the time he had bought. Good thing too. Do you remember the brand Craig? Yep. Yeah. I had a Craig radio. He, he bought a, in the 70s somewhere, he bought a Craig Power Play 8-track FM stereo. Didn't even have AM in it. Um. And he kept that in those trucks and in his cars before that. And that is still in the 80 Ford, which sits on the farm. It's no longer driven. Not, not since 93 or so. Um, so was it like a portable radio? No, it's it's a car stereo. But it hung okay. under the dash like the old time, you know. Back oh, wow. was like was done at that time with the aftermarket stereo gear. And So I had an actual Craig, like stereo component Craig uh, receiver. Sure. Um, I wish I still had that. But, don't know why I threw it away because it worked. It just, I, I'm like, yeah, I, don't need it. I know that radio was in the truck and it kind of worked, but like things like the volume control had gotten stuck. Uh, the lights were out in the cool power play meter that would pop up at certain volume levels. <laughs> and I never saw that work. And the nostalgia in me, since I grew up and that radio was in the truck, is I need to get with dad and go get that radio and repair it. You get that truck and repair it. So you need to. <laughs> It, uh, hey. it needs an engine. It's sitting there with no engine in it. So. I always took the engine now. <laughs> yeah, that started to rebuild it, and then it was just easier to buy something else. Mm. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah. all there. The rest of the truck's all there. So yeah. Four-wheel drive and everything. <laughs> oh, so you could probably find a roller engine for it. But it wouldn't be hard to repair it at all. Yeah. Ooh, I got a new answering machine. Ooh, what you get? That AT and T one that I was talking to you about, my first answering machine, the one that you said you th- are pretty sure you had the exact same one. Mm, sure, a little micro cassette one. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Single tape. Yeah, yeah, yep. single tape. So after the first message, that beep got really long. Beep, beep, beep. Yes, that's the one. Mine was one solid beep. It would so it go beep yeah. the whole time. It was fast forwarding and then beep. Because it would advance to the past the first message and then add yep. all the messages to the tape and then it would rewind yep. the tape all the way to play the announcement. That's kind yep. of a stupid design. But it was. <laughs> but the dual cassette uh, answering machines were like 150 bucks or more. Yeah. I mean, they were outrageous for the day. Even in that time when answering machines are like 40 bucks. Must have been the playback mechanisms added to the price then. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And the logic control for it, I'm sure, yeah. was a little more complicated. I don't know. I would have thought the logic control for a single tape would have been more so. <laughs> there, well, yeah, because there had to, have to be a, sensors to know where the audio stopped for the yeah, next message. And they, so. they did that with subtones. So sure, that, sure. that weren't audible at playback speed, but yeah. were audible when it was rewinding. Like old uh, radio station automation used to work. That's how yes. it used to work. So. The uh, cart tapes. I'm yep. very familiar with cart tapes. <laughs> I'd like to have an old cart machine. I don't know why. I don't know what Facebook I do with group it. that's all about those. And I don't know really? why. I don't really want one, but it's super interesting to see what the guy. I I want one. I don't know what I do with it, but I want one. There's a few guys around that have a, you know two or three racks of stuff in their garage, and they can just run an old radio station with old Drake Chanel automation and stuff. That's what I was getting ready to say. Is it's like you know have the announcements on one reel to reel and all the music on another, and they sync <laughs> together. So when the song awesome. stops, the other two reels start, do the next announcement, and then the next song starts. So <laughs> That's so cool. It's, it is pretty neat to watch. So. Oh, geez. Yeah. And cart carousels. So. See, I never have actually seen one of those in person. So, yeah, they had cart decks, but then they had cart carousels for animation. You'd load your commercial carts in a big round thing, and it would 
and change the cartel oh, wow. on its own. So. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. The one with the radio station that, that I uh, experienced was just, it was a little, it was about yay tall. I had three decks. Yeah. Um, and if I recall correctly, I think the middle deck did not work because old. And I have a cool picture somewhere. <laughs> Uh, from about 1979 or 80 that I found online of WUME down in Paoli, a town near all of us, uh, 95.3 down there. And they, they ran it completely on card automation in the, that era, and they had like six racks of gear, and it's a cool picture. So, oh, wow. yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us here on 3L Tech Dudes. Please subscribe to us here on YouTube for more tech old and new, tinkering at the workbench, repairs, ham radio, electronics, computers, and more. Please like this video and share 3OTD with your friends to help us grow the channel. We tweet at 3L Tech Dudes 1 on Twitter, and you can keep up with us on Facebook. Just search for 3OTD and look for our logo. Thanks so much for watching.